In some ways, I think uh, we are at a turning point for the uh, financial sector and more specifically banking. Um, we, I mean, if, uh, if you put the extremes of choices we have about alternative futures, one future would be where we are small, uh, we have an underperforming system uh, with lots of fragilities, uh, relatively poor governance, uh, and we are unable to fund the tremendous needs of this economy. That's one future and it's, it's well within our reach. There's another future which is we have a strong, vibrant, outward looking, um, efficient uh, banking system which uh, certainly reaches every corner of the country but also is uh, uh, powerful enough, savvy enough to fund the needs of this economy, but more, reaching outside creates a system uh, which, is, which is in many ways going to take advantage of in India's outward looking um, uh, path uh, over the last so many years and builds a strong global system. So that's, those are the two extremes and of course a lot lies in between. My sense is the choice between those two systems will be influenced in a ma major way by many of the people in this room. Uh, you have been uh, big participants uh, uh, in the process so far. You've taken us where we are, but going forward, uh, we still have a lot of possibilities and taking us to the better possibilities is basically in, in, in your hands. Now, let me give you some thoughts on, uh, on uh, bank structure uh, as well as the various components that uh, CAFRAL has very nicely put together. I think this is uh, the issues that it has focused on are the key issues. And the first question is why do we, why do we need to think about bank structure? What, what, what are we trying to achieve? And, and clearly, uh, you know, it comes from the overall needs of the economy. Finance is a handmaiden. It's a handmaiden to, to economic growth. We are helpers. We are lubricants to that process. Key, I mean, without lubrication, the system stops. The system clogs up and, and doesn't move. But we are not the central drivers of growth, except in small ways, which I'll talk about. But really what we're doing is to make growth possible. And therefore we have to look at where the sources of growth are in this country. And uh, you know, obviously over the next so many years, one of the biggest sources of growth will be infrastructure build out. We need to finance that. And uh, that's one reason we need a strong financial system. We need to figure out how to finance infrastructure. We haven't quite got there yet. Um, you know, Ideally, you would have uh, short-term finance, long-term finance. The short-term managed finance, which banks are about, uh, would take care of the construction part of infrastructure and then sell out to the long-term finance, which holds it to maturity. Loans would be appropriately structured so that this could happen. Uh, that's where we need to go. Uh, how do we make that possible? How do we draw in the long-term finance to take over from the short-term finance at the right time? How do we ensure uh, that the short-term finance is large enough, skilled enough to finance all types of infrastructure that comes about and creates the appropriate capital structure for the kind of infrastructure that comes, including the structuring of bank loans and so on. So we need to, we need to think about that. That's something that will, that will uh, happen. Um, in addition to infrastructure, of course, there's going to be tremendous business needs. Uh, we are a service-based economy, but manufacturing is also going to come into its own uh, even the kinds of services we have, construction, uh, uh, hotels, restaurants, many of them also need financing. So we need to figure out how to provide financing for, for those segments of the economy. And uh, uh, as Usha pointed out, inclusion, small and medium enterprises, retail customers, the poor, uh, getting them into the system is very important. Now, in all this, I've, I've talked initially about credit, but increasingly we are aware that payments and savings are also central. One of the big concerns over the last few years has been the fall in financial savings. We need to increase that. We need to bring more people to save inside the system, thereby allowing credit to flow to these uh, 
proper seg uh, to the um, to the um, to industry and to and to infrastructure. Now, so financial needs uh, meeting them, whether it's for loans, whether it's for savings, is is one part of what we need to do and why we need a banking structure which is able to do that. Uh, a second factor is providing high quality employment. You've seen in the last few months the fastest growing part of the economy seems to be the financial sector once again. Some of this may be distorted by the FCNR um, uh, deposits, but certainly uh, finance can provide high quality employment. In fact, it is the highest value added employment if you look at the uh, GDP statistics um, in the economy. So growing the financial sector has to be part of the growth process also. But I think it would be uh, limiting for us to see our vision as primarily India. We are an emerging market which starts out with a fairly strong financial system uh, given our level of GDP. And uh, we can work uh, given the tremendous human capital that we have, given the uh, tremendous capabilities we have, uh, to create a system that can expand around the world. Uh, so providing financial services across the globe, global expansion, Seems premature right now, but it is something that we should aim for over the next next decade. So these are the kinds of things we want the financial system to do. How do we do it in a way that is efficient, stable, uh, and, uh, and sustainable? And this is why uh, we need to think about bank structure. We need to think about whether we have entities that are too big to fail. We need to think about whether we have too many, too small entities which are not capable of financing uh, the kinds of needs that we have. We have to think about whether we have enough competition. Uh, and, and finally, we have to think about whether we have enough variety. Variety sometimes is a source of stability. Um, if you have market-based institutions, if you have, um, um, uh, if you have vibrant markets, if you have institutions, if you have institutions of various kinds, NBFCs, banks, etc. If big banks, small banks, all of that can contribute to stability because not everybody does the same thing. So in this kind of, uh, of, of um, sort of broad um, um, framework, let's think a little bit about some of the various topics you're going to talk about today. One is this differentiated licenses for new varieties of banks. Now, as you know, we are close to um, reaching the end of the process of giving out uh, bank licenses. But I want to say this is just the first step, a down payment where we show that we sort of have worked out a process to give bank licenses. Now we can use the learning from this process to go towards giving licenses out on tap. Uh, that would be the more general universal bank license, which we've been given, giving out in the past. But we can also move towards differentiated bank licenses because not everybody should or is capable of getting a universal bank license, we should allow for a variety of, of participants. Uh, the Nachiket Moore Committee has suggested payment banks, wholesale banks. Our own paper has suggested small banks. Uh, the variety of possibilities. And clearly, what you're trying to do by allowing a variety of licenses is um, benefit from specialization. Um, a specialized narrow payment bank uh, may not have to develop capabilities in lending, may be able to do payments much more effectively than if it was a universal bank, would, would be able to raise money, uh, whatever little money it needed at very low cost, and certainly it would be easier for us to monitor if all the money that it raised um, uh, from depositors went straight into treasury bills. It was a narrow bank, it didn't, we didn't have to worry about its lending and its losing money there. Um, it would allow for entities with relatively low complexity. Our universal banks are fairly complex entities, but with differentiated licenses, we would have low complexity entities. We could have far more such entities with the level of uh, supervisory capability that we can bring to bear. Uh, it would create more competition. A payment bank competing with a universal bank on payments, maybe the payment bank is more efficient, and that would, that would make, uh, make sense. It will also create a grooming ground. One of the problems we have with the, uh, the licensing process is uh, we want uh, these entities to be able to hit the ground running, which means they have to have very good capabilities. Now, um, it's very hard to generate these capabilities. Uh, if we create these differentiated bank licenses, we could 
watch some of these entities, maybe a small bank, uh, maybe a payments bank, and over time uh, gain enough confidence to give them a broader license. So it could be a, a, a transition process, a grooming ground, and as I said, there's, there's value to variety. Key question here, and, and this is something that we understand uh, very well, is that we have to create a relatively arbitrage-free structure. Now, uh, what does that mean? Well, we started out, if you remember, uh, with these universal banks under what I would call a grand implicit bargain. Uh, and um, in India, the bargain is more than in other countries. The bargain the banks enter into in other countries is they take short-term deposits, they get access to the, the uh, lending window that the, reserve, uh, that the central bank has. This is the bargain. You get liquidity in return, uh, uh, and um, you, you take short-term deposits. Uh, that creates the possibility of becoming illiquid. The central bank gives you liquidity facilities, and that's, you know, uh, the, you sub, you, uh, because you get that, you allow yourself to be regulated, etc. Now, in India, because uh, access to deposits typically means access to relatively low-cost money, there's another layer of obligation that we have imposed, which is priority sector lending. This is the grand bargain, get access to deposits, get access, essentially the ability to print money, and uh, therefore, in return for that, you have one, the traditional liquidity requirements, CRR, SLR. SLR is probably a little more than required by pure liquidity. Uh, it's also a way to fund the government, but that's part of the grand bargain. And the second aspect of the grand bargain is priority sector lending. Now, in general, this has worked reasonably well. The banks have been able to make money despite these obligations, uh, precisely because the value of low-cost funding has been quite substantial. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have the specter of a number of finance companies which are unregulated, don't have these kinds of obligations, wanting to become banks. And the notion has to be that bank licenses are still valuable. Now, of course, when we allow these entities in a differentiated way, the question would be, are they subject to the same kind of obligations? And to my mind, what is absolutely easy to say is on the payment side, if a bank comes in, wants to be a payment bank, it takes in deposits only for the purpose of payments, then clearly if it is subject to CRR SLR but is not allowed to lend, then it's basically on the same playing field as uh, the universal banks. So it raises money. It's forced to invest it all in t uh, treasury bonds, and uh, essentially it can pay its depositors uh, some haircut on that, uh, on that rate that it makes uh, for the uh, time that it holds. It really is giving depositors a payment service, and that accounts for why they would put their money in there. Uh, that seems like an entity which has relatively low arbitrage. It's something that uh, even our universal banks can do today to some extent. The big difficulty, I think, comes when you start talking about priority sector. Because in addition, uh, we, we've sort of said, as soon as you start lending, you incur the priority sector uh, norms. And so the question would be, if we go to the wholesale bank that we have uh, the Nachiket Moore Committee uh, talking about, should the wholesale bank be subject to priority sector norms? Right, And there, I, I think the key question to debate is how much is the priority sector norm associated with, quote unquote, the word bank, and how much is it associated with the rents that come from being able to access low-cost deposits? If you believe that it comes largely from the ability to access low-cost deposits, which is why you have the priority sector obligation. It takes off some of the rents by forcing you to lend to certain segments of society. Well, in that case, maybe what we should do is tie priority sector lending also to some extent to how you finance yourself. Finance yourself more from deposits, you have more of a priority sector obligation. Finance yourself with long-term funds, you become more like a finance company, a non-bank finance company, NBFC, and in that case, your priority sector obligation 
gets diminished. That would be, in my view, one way to think about the arbitrage and reducing the arbitrage. Of course, another way would be to subject anybody who lends to priority sector, but then you're, distinct, you're, you're, you're not taking into account that one of the reasons you have priority sector is because of the way you finance yourself, low cost deposits, and that's the reason you have these priority sector norms. We have to think about this, but I think this is one of the things that we have to spend a fair amount of time uh, looking at. Um, the final question is access to the window, access to uh, LAF, access to uh, uh, your, these term auctions. Uh, these are all s sources of small or moderate rents also, but most important, they allow you to maintain a relatively illiquid balance sheet because you know you have access when push comes to shove, and maintaining a relatively illiquid balance sheet can again be a source of relatively low cost finance, right? Uh, otherwise, you would have to maintain a liquid balance sheet, uh, essentially allowing you to earn less on your asset side. So again, we have to think about how we view this access to the window. Will a differentiated bank, say a wholesale bank, as in the Nachiket Moore Committee report, get access to the window? Or will it only get uh, you know, second or third hand access, or access only in emergency? We have to think about that because that then tells us uh, you know, what kinds of obligations again. This, the, the point is we, we have to, in a sense, break down the package that universal banks get today and see what aspects of the package are tied together. And if those aspects of the package are tied together, how do we transform them to the, to the other parts of the differentiated bank license so that the playing field is level, there is no arbitrage through the back door. Um, Let's, uh, le I mean, the, let's move on from, uh, um, the, the point I'm trying to make here is, is that we could see over time as we think through this and develop the regulatory structure uh, that banks have a choice of moving away from deposits towards more long-term financing. And as they move towards long-term financing, if we go the first ro route that I talked about, they may have fewer priority sector obligations because they're not getting access to the low cost deposits, uh, which is the source of the priority sector obligation. They become more NBFC-like. Alternatively, NBFCs could become more bank-like by going towards very short-term funding, in which case they would attract more priority sector obligations. We could have a variety of possibilities. The point again is that we need to do some thinking. I'm hopeful that the kinds of debates that CAFRA will, will bring today will help us think through this. And as you can see, we, at least I personally, don't have strong views on this. What I think is important is to create a level playing field, and we have to worry about how to do it. Um, that brings us next to cooperatives and, uh, and varieties of cooperatives, uh, uh, as well as the uh, RRBs. The, the idea behind this was essentially to benefit from the cooperative movement which I think is a very important movement, uh, is a very great source of development in a number of countries. And the key question is, have we got all the benefits from the cooperative movement that we would have liked? And one of the worries is that in a number of cooperatives, and I, I don't want to tar the whole segment, I think there are many fine cooperatives out there, but the cooperativeness of the cooperative is very limited. Uh, they have been captured. They've been captured by a, by a variety of interests. And as a result, the failure rate in the sector is much higher than we would like. Uh, we need to worry about that. This cannot be a backdoor way of making fiscal transfers to certain segments of the population, we, because ultimately it, it destroys, to some extent, the whole lending culture. It destroys the culture of credit. So we need to strengthen the cooperative sector but also work out what the right governance structure is here and work towards a more effective governance structure. In many countries, governance is not in the hands of the borrowers. In fact, you would keep governance far away from the borrowers because it's like putting uh, the fox in charge of the chicken, chicken coop. You would rather have the depositors as being the, the source of the governance structure. Uh, and you would have a governance structure which is 
exchangeable. It is like the depositors or the shareholders and keep voting. A number of cooperatives work on broadly these principles, but some don't. And those are the ones that become problematic over time for us. So we need a number of very good reports on the cooperative sector. We need to figure out how to make this cooperative sector work because it, the, the capabilities it can bring to bear, especially in lending to small, medium, uh, rural industry, um, um, small and medium industry in, in urban areas, reaching the, uh, the poorer segments of the population. There are, we, we, we are underutilizing the capabilities of the sector. We need to figure out how to make it work better. And that, that to my mind, is, is, is something that is, that, is, that is key. Now, the RRBs were thought of as a way of doing this. Many of you know that uh, they haven't, again, delivered as, as promised, partly because the cost structure itself has grown to resemble the cost structure of the public sector banks. And uh, to some extent, the terms of, and conditions of service have also become similar. So the idea that you would get a local presence uh, with local information, et cetera, has, has not been reached. Um, uh, and, and we need to think about how we, um, how we change that. So lots of thinking to think about, uh, lots of thinking on cooperatives and RRBs. Uh, there are lots of good examples from around the world of how this, this structure can be made successful. We need to think uh, and use th that kind of, uh, of learning uh, to help strengthen the, 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 the structures and get a vibrant cooperative sector. Uh, finally, foreign banks. I mean, I, I think foreign banks bring a lot to the table. They have very strong capabilities. They have good technology. And they bring, bring a lot of competition in new areas uh, to our banking system. And so uh, we have benefited from the foreign banks in, uh, in India, uh, and, uh, and we would like them to, uh, to continue doing uh, what they do well. Two big uh, concerns, of course, in the last few years have emerged. One is the possibility of contagion from outside. Uh, that is, if there, is problem, if there are problems in, uh, in, in uh, nearer headquarters, do the foreign banks withdraw? And, and I think across the world, the experience has been mixed. In some countries, you've seen a dramatic withdrawal of, uh, of, uh, of capital as well as a shrinkage of activities. This has hurt. In some other countries, you've actually seen the foreign banks have proven a source of stability in bad times. So uh, we, have to be, uh, we have to take our lessons from that. Um, over time, what we would like is that the foreign banks incorporate domestically. Uh, we will work to make this happen. Uh, we haven't pressed very hard so far, uh, but this is work in, uh, in progress. It is not the first priority today, but it will eventually be a priority. Um, uh, second uh, big concern, uh, especially amongst emerging markets with our kind of history, is, is the dominance of foreign banks? Is it possible that the country could be dominated by foreign banks? Now, there is a, a, a whole debate to be had, which I don't want to enter into, into what does it mean to be foreign? If the entire sort of employee population of the quote unquote foreign bank is domestic, how different is it from a domestic bank which is owned 65% by FIIs? Uh, that's a debate that, uh, that could well be had, but I don't want to enter into that debate. The point, however, is that uh, in a country like ours, um, you know, at some point, people would start getting worried if, uh, if the banking sector was, was dominated by foreign banks. Fortunately, we are very, very far from that, uh, that level. And I think we have a long way to go before we reach that. Uh, we, in the, uh, in the paper on, on foreign bank, um, uh, incorporation into wholly owned subsidiaries, we sort of set a, uh, a number, 20% of the banking system, at which point we would reconsider uh, what needs to happen. I think we're not going to reach that over the next decade. Uh, so this is an issue which should not perturb us at this point. So uh, at this point, I think what we want to do is create a system where a variety of entities can compete, can uh, create efficiency. The one big issue I haven't touched at all, 
and I should not touch, given this is election season, is what we do about improving the capabilities of the public sector banks. Uh, this is, in many ways, the gorilla in the room on bank structure. Uh, and, you know, we all have benefited. Uh, I'm talking about the players in the room, uh, whether private sector, whether foreign sector, from the public sector. Many of you are, many of your employees, your key employees, came from the public sector. So the public sector has been a grooming ground for a lot that is good in the banking system and has the capability of becoming uh, very efficient players in the banking system. We need to figure out over the next few years uh, both uh, how to uh, strengthen them from where they are right now because clearly uh, NPAs are an issue and, uh, and they're working uh, quite hard to bring them down but it is going to be an ongoing process over the next, next couple of years. But equally important, uh, how to strengthen the governance structure so that public sector CEOs get more time to deliver uh, rather than one or two year terms, and uh, uh, how they can be protected uh, from, uh, from suboptimal decisions. But, but as important, how they get capabilities because we're going to see a spate of retirements in the public sector leaving a large uh, sort of middle which is unpopulated and we need more capabilities in the public sector how do we create those capabilities ideally again uh, a public uh, a government owned banking uh, system having part of the banking system government owned can only contribute to the variety and the stability of the system so I think it has to be an integral part of the system, but how do we make it part of the, uh, a vibrant part of the system, uh, resuming its natural place, is something that over the next few months we will have to debate very, very strongly. Um, last piece, I, I said I'd talk for 15 minutes, I think I've spoken much longer, um, is, is, uh, is mergers, consolidation, etc. cetera. Uh, this is again something that we should be uh, prepared for going forward, not forced, but, but open uh, to the possibility so that we get uh, players of reasonable scale where needed, uh, but also capabilities are brought to bear on some of the weaker banks in the system so that they can be strengthened. But uh, uh, I think this is something that we have to watch and wait for. Certainly, uh, I think the regulator uh, provided, uh, you know, issues of competition and so on are met is quite open to the possibility.